All right, sorry about the noise, just getting myself set up. And let me just find the, just got to get the link so I can share it with everyone who wants to, uh, everyone who actually wants to, uh, Okay, so my apologies, I'm usually not this, uh, <laughs> actually sometimes I am. Okay, that's that there. Let me hit that. That is fine. Okay, so let me get myself set up here. <clears throat> Let me pull up my lovely warm reading blanket in my warm reading bed with my warm reading son next to me. Say hello, warm reading son. Salutations. Salutations. He even speaks uh, proper English. I've taught him well. So forgive me for the uh, slight noise. Because nothing says preparedness like microphone rumble. Anyway, I'm just going to slowly get myself set up. Slowly get myself set up. Make sure my volumes are... Make sure my volumes are, are there. Now, I'm doing a live reading of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman L. Geisler and Frank Turek. Uh, this is the book that kicked off my counter-apologetics, uh, I wouldn't say career, but, you know, um, my interest in counter-apologetics. Um, a, a person I know uh, enthusiastically recommended I read this book, um, and I actually started a blog to uh, counter some of the, some of the claims. Uh, that blog then became, it was it was dedicated initially to countering the claims of this book. Um, I found that once I got to chapter three, um, my blood pressure kept on rising and rising just due to the uh, um, some of the outrageous and silly claims that the the book makes. But also, um, the the blog uh, morphed into ca uh, counter apologetics in general. Uh, the book then more sorry the the blog then morphed into well say the blog is still going but then uh, I devoted time to the book uh, the best religion for the task at hand and that's still available on iTunes and Google Play um, that then became well that then after that a, a Twitter uh, account started just to raise awareness um, then from there uh, the podcast. And now from the podcast, the live stream. So um, if you're listening to this, you have uh, Norman Geisler and Frank Turek to thank, and with a special thanks to a man named uh, Theo Tsurdalakis for recommending the book to me. So um, th thank you for the monster you've helped create. So yes, yeah, so I'm going to... So I'm going to start with the foreword by David Limbaugh, or Limbaugh, however you want to say it. And I'll, I'll, let's just ask, are we comfortable? Are we comfortable? Okay, the, the, the reading sun is uh, comfortable, and I hope wherever you are, you're comfortable as well. The foreword. As one who came to Christ, after years of scepticism, I have a particular affection for Christian apologetics. It is one of my passions. There is an abundance of evidence for the reliability of Scripture, for the authority of the Bible as the inspired Word of God, and that the Bible accurately portrays the historical events it covers including the early li the earthly life of Jesus Christ. Indeed, powerful and convincing proof exists that Christianity is the one true religion, 
that the triune God who reveals himself in its pages is the one and only God of the universe, and that Christ died for our sins so that we may live. Proof, of course, is no substitute for faith, which is essential to our salvation and for our communion with God. Nor is the study of apologetics dis disrespectful to our faith. Rather, it augments it, informs it, bolsters it, and reinvigorates it. Were it otherwise, the Bible would not say, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 1 Peter 3.15 um, Quick pause. Uh, I can already pick up a few um, a few errors uh, in that. Um, yeah, this uh, it seems that when you when your identity is wedded to the belief that the book is true, you will accept um, that the book is true. Um, and I do like the uh, I do like the claim. Uh, well, firstly, the uh, Christianity is one true religion. Um, as if there's a method for determining which religion is true and which one's not. Uh, a triune God, um, that's definitely not in the, uh, well, especially in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, then there's, I've been getting to arguments about that uh, recently. And uh, the one and only God of the universe. Um, that's interesting in that um, if, if the proof for the existence of a God is the texts in which the... Uh, that that God is written in, then yeah, of course. But it's actually quite interesting that even in the Bible itself, um, at least two dozen gods are named. So even he's saying that God is the one and only God of the universe. Um, you know, you kind of have to cut a lot of the Bible out to to get to that to get to that position. And but yeah, where he says proof, you know, of course, is no substitute for faith. But um, what is what is faith? Um, pretending what you know ain't so, I think, is the most snappy uh, snappy answer. Yeah, yes, can I help you? Okay, you just uh, drawing doodles in the. My my son is next to me, uh, drawing doodles in the air. Okay, parabolas, not doodles. The doodles are parabolas. They're just doodles with a mathematical structure. Anyway, I can click my fingers and back to the book. I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist is the best single book I've seen to prepare believers to give reasons for their faith and for skeptics who are open to the truth. This book will serve as an indispensable evangelism tool, especially when dealing with non-believers with intellectual obstacles to the faith. As we know, the intellectual obstacles are usually just an excuse for non-believers, but when you remove the substance of their excuse, they are left naked to confront their real obstacles, their real demons. But I believe there's another important reason for the scriptural mandate to be prepared to give an answer. It's not just to help us effectively communicate the gospel. Being prepared will also arm us with the tool to resist certain nagging doubts that we encounter in moments of weakness. It will, because it marshals the evidence for Christianity, fortify our faith. Um, so just off those last two, last two paragraphs, um, yeah, like, when he, now what line was it? Um, the intellectual obstacles. Um, this is written exactly like it, like a guy who has uh, prejudicially decided that uh, no evidence is valid if it contradicts his worldview. And it's a shame because, like, if you, if you say that you know we're just making excuses, well, look, uh, I'll agree. Like, we are making ex we do make excuses, but the the excuse that like rationalists like myself give is that the evidence just isn't there and to and the next the next thing i'll say is that to make the evidence fit you have to presuppose 
the thing that you're trying to prove, which is an inherently circular. Anyway, so I'm going to click my fingers and back to the book. Who can doubt that we need to be better equipped with the evidence? Whether to help us better evangelize or to strengthen our own faith. As if the temptations of the flesh weren't enough for us to contend with, we are also confronted daily with negative external influences. In modern times, these influences would have grown increasingly sinister and insidious, as the Bible warned they would. In times past, non-believers had to decide whether Christianity was the one true religion, whether any of them were true, or whether God existed at all. But they generally were not saddled with the burden of determining whether there's, there was such a thing as truth. Our postmodern culture has done a number on the idea of truth. It teaches that truth and morality are relative, that there is no such thing as absolute truth. To the intellectual elite dominating our universities and the mainstream media, these ideas are considered enlightened and progressive, even though we all intuitively understand that absolute truth exists, and more importantly, we all conduct our lives with that recognition. And this seems to be the, uh, this is a, a, a general theme that I've picked up on with, uh, with this book in general, just from my previous reading of it, is that it rails a lot against uh, university professors and uh, colleges and mainstream media, um, almost as if there's a like a, a persecution going on, um, and yeah, like moral moral relativists and you know intellectual relativists and all that kind of stuff. Um, like I will, how can I say, I wouldn't say that absolute truth exists, but what I will say, like not as a material object, of course, but there are things that are that are true um re well actually well i suppose the, the, the truth is the truth of regardless regardless of your feelings um so in that in in that case you know i kind of kind of do agree with where he's coming from but um i, I would have put it as things can be true regardless of how we feel about them is probably probably the uh the best the best way but yeah this the book does now i suppose spoiler alert you know it does create a very us versus them di dichotomy and the, it doesn't really uh how can i say it, it doesn't really question um rational skepticism it, it's more the book more rallies against you know college professors and uh yeah those, those kind of stuff those kind of people so you know i'll click my fingers and we'll go back to the book If you encounter one of these geniuses, who is so certain that truth is a social construct, defined by the powerful to remain in power, ask him if he will be willing to test his theory by leaping from the tallest building around. You might also want to quiz him on the law of non-contradiction. Ask him whether he believes that two contradictory things can be true at the same time. If he has the intellectual dishonesty to say yes, ask him how, how certain he is that absolute truth does not exist. Is he absolutely certain? It is though interesting that um, this this test of, uh, so this is where we're in the sentence, if you encounter one of these geniuses who are so certain that truth is a social construct, um, ask him to test if he'd be willing to test his theory by leaping, leaping from the tallest building. This is um, actually the most intellectually honest uh, f uh, definition of truth, uh, that which comports with the reality, or that which can be demonstrated. And as uh, I've quoted this a few times in recent weeks, uh, R. Ra has the saying, if you can't show it, you don't know it, which is actually a good way of, uh, good way of putting it.
Anyway, so the um, the reading son is just about to. Well, he doesn't want to be next to daddy. Is he going to the toilet? Are you going to the toilet there? He's going to the toilet. Okay. Let him close the door. So yeah, it's um. Now yeah, it's interesting that you know the Davy Limbaugh will. Uh, define truth as well he, he'll accept the definition of truth of that which can be demonstrated and then believe in a god that has no uh that is not able to be demonstrated which is uh, <laughs> a little bit laughable and anyway, i'll click my fingers and back in we go yes truth is a casualty of our popular culture and when truth goes the authority of the gospel is undermined because the gospel tells us all about the truth, with a capital T. We can see evidence of this everywhere today. The modern notions of tolerance and pluralism are a direct result of the culture's assault on truth. Liberal secularists insist that tolerance is the highest virtue, but they don't tell you what they mean by tolerance. To them, Tolerance doesn't simply involve treating those with different ideas respectfully and civilly. It means affirming their ideas as valid, which Christians can't do without renouncing their own beliefs. If, for example, you subscribe to the biblical prohibition on homosexual behaviour as sinful, you cannot at the same time affirm that such behaviour is not sinful. The postmodern secularists doesn't have to confront these questions because he rejects the idea of absolute truth and the law of non-contradiction. He, he can just go on his merry way, moralizing to everyone about tolerance and never having to explain the intrinsic contradictions in his views. Uh, and this is, this is uh, I suppose, the, the start of where he starts to where the book starts to define atheism as, you know, anyone who is tolerant and plural and, you know, like basically it railroads atheism as moral relativism and even moral moral nihilism, which it completely is not. Uh, atheism is simply without gods. There are, you know, the, the only thing that you share as an atheist is that you don't believe in the existence of gods. There is no like there is no moral package that turns up in your doorsteps when you you sign up to join the club. So you know, so when he says liberal secularist, like in a way, I'd possibly consider myself a liberal secularist, though not um, not very liberal. You know, I rate somewhere towards the centre and probably a little bit conservative leaning. But that's, you know, though, you know, with the liberal, some liberal values as well. But, yeah, it's, but yeah, just be aware that, yeah, further on in this book, you will get the impression that anyone who doesn't believe what uh, Frank and Norman believe, they are just moral nihilists, which is, uh... anyway, the, the reading sign is back. Say hello. Salutations. There he is, he's back. Anyway, um, do you want to lie down? Okay, and I'll click my, I'll click my fingers, and we'll get back to the book. The tolerance peddlers are further exposed as frauds when you consider that they will simply that they simply will not practice what they preach, at least toward those annoyingly stubborn Christians. They are absolutely unwilling to tolerate the Christian premise that Jesus Christ is the way the truth, and the life. For them to acknowledge this would necessarily refute their concept of tolerance, which holds that all ideas are of equal merit. In their infinite resourcefulness, they carve out an exception to their demand for universal tolerance when it comes to their treatment of Christians. To them, Christianity's exclusive truth claims are simply beyond the pale so bad as to disqualify Christians from receiving tolerance from others. One secularist university administrator, for instance, disciplined a conservative professor 
for exposing her class to literature from a Christian viewpoint, which included an article about how teachers should approach homosexuality. The administrator exclaimed, We cannot tolerate the intolerable! You see, it's fairly easy for these types to extricate themselves from their indefensible positions. They simply move the goalpost. Talk about defining truth through power. And it's interesting that um, Dave Limbaugh here, you know, talks about moving the goalposts when you know, I get into numerous uh, conversations on Twitter and on social media in general. And, uh, yeah, like if you, if you want to talk about moving the goalposts, ask an anti evolutionist to define the word kind. And, yeah, you'll see, uh, <laughs> you'll, uh, See the uh, the moving the goalposts, the uh, the squirming, the kicking and squealing. Um, yeah. So anyway, let me just uh, you know, click my fingers again. But the Christians' belief that theirs is the one true religion doesn't make them intolerant of others or disrespectful of their right to believe and worship how they choose. Um, I'm going to call B, uh, BS on that because um, if you go back, even if you go back to the the eighteen, even the early nineteen hundreds, um, uh, it may maybe the nineteen seventies. Well, from my uh, understanding, probably the nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies, there was great sectarian divisions between you know different denominations. Um, if you go you go back to Ireland with the um the 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 troubles there um if you go through to the Puritans in the sixteen hundreds um yeah and there's a there there's a joke that I read about um a, a person who pushed another another person off a bridge and looking fun you probably heard the joke before um because he wasn't a um he wasn't something hyper hyper specific like you yeah, and. I forget what the actual joke is, but yeah, he was like a he was a Baptist, but the wrong kind of Baptist is the the, the short answer of the joke. So um, the sentence here that you know the Christians believe that is doesn't make them intolerant of others. Um, I'm gonna call BS because uh, yeah, <laughs> Christians throughout history have had a a long history of being intolerant towards others. And even if you're in the in the Bible Belt of the United States, um, you know, if you dare to be, uh, you know, I can say, to be different, then you know, you know I think this is what uh, Telltale uh, found out was that yeah, if you uh, if you kick the hornet's nest, um, if you're the wrong side of the hornet's nest, then uh, you get um. Anyway, uh, click my fingers and we'll go back in. Our modern culture is woefully confused about these distinctions and the use of the Christians' confidence in their own belief system to paint Christian Christians as intolerant of others with different belief systems. Nothing could be more inaccurate. Besides, for the record, Christianity isn't the only religion with exclusive truth claims. All major religions have such claims. Many of the central ideas of the major religions cannot be reconciled, which gives the lie to the trendy tenet of pluralism that all religions at their core are the same. I do not know of anyone who actually says that. Really, I do not know anyone who goes, oh, we should treat all religious, like, you know, I've heard of people saying that, you know, all religions at their core are, are the same, but I don't know anyone who actually who actually practices it. I don't know anyone, anyone personally who actually believes that. This is, uh... Yeah, so I'm a little, a little bit worried already. You know, I'll click my fingers and we'll go back in. We often hear or read that all people, wherever located, worship the same God through different languages and cultures. This idea, with all due respect, is absurd on its face. For example, Islam teaches that Christ was a mere prophet, not deity. As C.S. Lewis observed, 
if Christ is not God, then he could not have been an exemplary prophet. And I'll turn the page. Or a great moral teacher, because he claims to be God. If he was not who he said he was, then he was either a liar or a lunatic. Hardly a great moral teacher or prophet. As another obvious example, the claims of certain Eastern religions that God is in everything and that there is no discrete distinction between the creator and creation is utterly, utterly irreconcilable with Christianity. The examples are endless. But the point is that while various religions may share some overlapping values, many of their fundamental beliefs cannot be squared. It may make people feel better to pretend that all religions are essentially the same, but this concept is demonstrably false. But political correctness in our culture generally carries the day. Even many of our churches have become corrupted with these misguided notions of tolerance and pluralism. They have allowed their theology to be diluted and have permitted the authority of scripture to be denigrated in favour of society's evolved ideas about morality. Only a version of Christianity that preaches that all religions are the same is tolerant and loving. Traditional, Bible-based Christianity is intolerant, insensitive, exclusive, and unloving. Oh boy, how uh, how close-minded this this gentleman is. Um, if only he, uh, yeah, if only he he may have heard of a, a church called the Westboro Baptist Church, who are you know thoroughly Bible-believing and are probably one of the most hated churches in um in the world. Um, he hasn't heard of cults. Um, who again who have a very strict uh, interpretation. The independent fundamental Baptist movement, um, even in some cases the the, the latter rain, uh, the latter rain movements, um, yeah. And so when you say, and even when you say authority of scripture, you kind of have to be um, be specific and say which one, because uh, anyone who's studied the history of the scripture will know that um, you know there has been changes. Uh, revisions, uh, translations, uh, what's the old saying? Uh, translation equals interpretation. So, uh, yes. Anyway, I'll click my fingers and uh, back to the reading. How loving, though, is it to become an accomplice of the destruction of truth itself? To the evisceration of the gospel? How sensitive is it to aid people away from the path of life? As a Christian, how can you explain Christ's decision to voluntar voluntarily to subject himself to the indignities and humiliation of human form, to experience wholesale separation from the Father, to physically accept all of the real wrath of the Father for all of mankind's past, present, and future sins, and to suffer the indescribable torment and death on the cross, if all other paths to God are the same, what an immeasurable insult to the finished work of Christ on the cross! What an act of deliberate disobedience to Christ's directions that we spread the gospel to the corners of the earth! For if all religions are the same, then we've made a liar out of Christ and rendered his great commission a useless farce because we have removed all incentive to evangelize. <laughs> Oh, David, you have uh, indeed um, brought brought the book uh, hook, line, and sinker. Um, and even here, I would uh, say you know your theology is uh, I won't say novel, but um, yeah, definitely fundamentalist. And um, yeah, there's uh, issues there. But anyway, I will uh, click my fingers and we'll get going again. I'm not suggesting that Christians should approach evangelism stridently or disrespectfully. 
<laughs> Sorry to click again so soon, but uh, as someone on uh, on Twitter who um, how can I say? Yeah, we uh, definitely uh, um, I've had to block numerous uh, Christians on Twitter because they are um, the probably the nice word for it is uh, strident or maybe disrespectful or maybe even antipathic. Um, but yeah, there are some there are some very horrible people on social media who who claim to be Christians. Um, and yeah, so I suppose the other thing I've just thought about this book is that this book isn't really like it's not really here to try present a rational a rational case. It's more um, trying to uh, how can I say give you little bits and then say these bits are representative of the whole and this is uh, this is why you should anyway I'll click my fingers and we'll get back into it we should certainly honor the principle that all people are equal in God's sight and entitled to equal protection of the law as well as fair courteous and respectful treatment sorry again but <laughs> again this is a uh, because I just had an, uh, got into a debate about uh, slavery, slavery in the Bible, and um, yeah, it's there was a uh, a thing I posted the other the other week that um why why is it then that when uh, when the church is you know feeding the homeless and uh, doing charity then it's then it's God's church but when the church is endorsing slavery and uh, trying to cover up crimes from from their horrible past oh then all of a sudden you know that the church is not the body of christ anymore and you can't can't have it you can't have it both ways and one of the things is uh, uh slavery you know if we asked um people in the south of america in the 1800s you know to express the notion that all people are equal in god's sight uh you would definitely have got a different answer and they would have uh provided numerous scriptures to uh back up that answer so, you know, I'll click my fingers, we'll get back in. Click fingers. Thank you. But there is no moral imperative that we adopt the notion that all belief systems are equally true. There is a moral imperative that we do not. The above reference scriptural passage instructing us to be prepared to give the reasons for our faith is immediately followed by the caution. But do this with gentleness and respect keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. We must be mindful of the next sentence as well. It is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. We must preach the truth, even if it makes us unpopular, even if it leads to the charge that we are intolerant or insensitive, even if it leads to our suffering and persecution. Yes, we must evangelize with gentleness and respect, but above all, we must evangelize. We must not be silenced by the tolerance police. Oh boy, uh, David Limbaugh needs to, needs to get on Twitter and just see how... Um, just see how uh, how bad some uh, people, uh, you know, they 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 indeed evangelize, but um, the, the gentleness and respect part seem to go right out the window, and it's just uh, it's, you know, and when you bring that up, um, yeah, there was a there was a there was a guy I forget his uh, his full uh, handle, but I think he went by the name of Christian Street Fighter. And he was one of the most repugnant people I've uh, I've come across. Are you right there? Okay. the The reading son is uh, I think he's bored. Um. So yeah, but we must be not be must not be silenced by the tolerance police. Yeah, I get that, but also you know just don't be an asshat. You know, don't be so obnoxious that you refuse to listen to good arguments. That's probably the thing I, I, I would say. Um, and this is the thing that, you know, God must win all arguments, you know, regardless of... Yeah, I certainly believe that. But anyway, I'll click my fingers and we'll get back into... I frequently come into contact with people who either don't believe in Christianity 
or who do, but have serious problems with part of the Bible or elements of Christian doctrine. I'm certainly no expert in theology. So what do I tell these people? Beyond suggesting the daunting task of reading the Bible from start to finish, how do I help them to discover the truths that I belatedly discovered? There are so many wonderful books available that will help, but there seem to be drawbacks with each one. They are too scholarly, or too incomplete, or too difficult to read. To get the complete package, I usually have to recommend more than one book, which significantly, significantly decreases the chance that any of them will be read. Not long ago, a friend asked me for resources on apologetics that he could share with his non-believing sibling. I knew that we'd probably only have one shot at this in the immediate future, so I had to come up with just the perfect book. Frankly, I put off the, the decision because I couldn't decide among three or four of my favourite sources, none of which, by itself, would have been sufficient, in my opinion. Just as I was preparing to cop out and make a recommendation of multiple books, instead of just one, I received a note from Frank Turek, asking me to review I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. After reading the first few chapters of the book, I was convinced my receipt of this of the book was providential. Now, um, this is a, an interesting thing. Um, how many how many books do you really need to produce to justify your um, justify belief in the most perfect book ever? Um, this is something that you know, I do find weird in that and I remember asking this question of a pastor at church once, you know, um, how do I reconcile, you know, what I see with what I believe was, uh, or what I, what I feel is the, the basic answer of the question. And he recommended, he recommended a book written in the 1900s, uh, of all things. And it was just weird that, okay, look, hold on, well, why are you recommending a book written that, like, why would I even have to read this uh, yeah, this other book? You know, isn't the, the, the Bible supposed to be wholly perfect and inerrant? Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, interesting. But anyway, I'll, uh, I'll turn the page. And I'll click my fingers. Finally, I thought, there is one book that covers the gamut in a highly readable format. After reading it, I told Frank that this is the one book I've been waiting for as an evangelical tool to explain the ideas and unveil the truth in a way that is far above my pay grade. As of the printing of this book, there will now be one source I can recommend to skeptics, doubters, or Christians who need some reinforcing evidence. I already know 10 people of whom I will give this book. It's truly a godsend. Frank Turek, whom I've now come to know as a tremendous gentleman and Christian scholar, co-authored this book with the giant among giants in the field of Christian apologetics, Dr. Norman Geisler. I have a number of Dr. Geisler's other works, including Christian Apologetics, when Christians ask, and when skeptics uh, skeptics ask. Inter interestingly, I was first exposed to Dr. Geisler through my friend and former neighbour, Dr. Steve Johnson, a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and one of my spiritual mentors. Steve loaned me, I can't remember if I ever returned it, a videotape in which Dr. Geisler was explaining the truths of Christianity in a most entertaining and captivating way. It was at that point that I decided to purchase and consume a number of his incredible books on apologetics. I would recommend any and all of Dr. Geisler's books, but I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, it is just what the doctor ordered for a one-stop source for those who might not be willing to wade through a number of books. I have to admit, 
The title particularly intrigued me, since I have long believed that it does take more than faith to be an atheist. It certainly takes more faith to believe that human beings evolve from the random interaction of molecules, which some had to come into existence themselves, than to believe in a creator. This book also appealed to me, because before tackling the issue of the truth of Christianity, it addresses the issue of truth itself, conclusively proving the existence of absolute truth. It demolishes the follies of moral relativism and postmodernism, then proceeds systematically to march towards the inescapable truths of the Christian religion. This is a book that had to be written, and even more has to be published. So I'll stop the gushing now and let this book go to press. Many a hungry soul awaits the truths that are brilliantly set out in this work. Dave Limbaugh Oh boy, um... Now, so I've read I've read the first few chapters of this book already, and I can tell you that if this is the best one stop shop book for uh, proving the existence of God, um, the the case isn't that strong. There are some issues. There are some issues where, um, yeah, Geisel and Turek completely mangle the history of science, and I think that's in um, a couple of, couple of chapters time. But anyway, um, if you have any comments. Have any thoughts? Leave leave a comment down below. Check me out on Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash TFAD pod. Or check me out on Twitter at TFAD pod. Otherwise, look after yourselves. Happy reading. Uh, and goodbye from the uh, from the reading sun.